Hello everyone, my name is Joanne and my talk today is called Disability and Wellness and Equity Caution for Libraries. When I saw the theme for this conference was wellness, I was a bit alarmed. I'm a person with a disability and advocate for equity for people with disabilities and wellness doesn't have happy connotations for me. In this presentation, basically, I'm going to talk about why that is. First, I'm going to discuss the context of our current social concept of wellness and where it comes from. Second, I'm going to talk about our social concept of disability and why wellness is problematic from a disability perspective. And eventually, I'm going to bring all this back to academic libraries and talk about wellness programming and how it might be done with disability and other forms of equity in mind. I'll get started first with talking about wellness. Wellness on first glance seems like a positive concept that everyone can get behind. But that's because our ideas of wellness in our society are so ingrained they seem natural, and we don't tend to think about where those ideas come from. In fact, those ideas are culturally specific and are relatively new. They've shifted and evolved a lot since the 1980s. What does wellness mean to us, and where do our ideas about it come from? In this part, I'm going to draw a lot from scholarship on wellness and disability. I'm relying a lot on a few works, Bassus, What's Bad About Wellness, Edwards and Imri, Disability and the Implications of the Well-Being Agenda, and Hall and Pasquale, Towards a Critical Theory of Corporate Wellness, along with Susan Wendell's The Rejected Body. Together, these give an excellent overview of the concept of wellness as it's evolved in the last few decades, especially in the U.S. and the U.K., though the Canadian situation is very similar. In the past few decades, we've had what scholars call a wellness movement. It's become increasingly important to us to achieve wellness, and we try to do that through many means, from organic foods to yoga and exercise to health monitoring devices. This upswing in concern about wellness in our society has happened at the same time as a rise in neoliberalism as a dominant way of thought. Among other things, neoliberalism really focuses on and prioritizes individualism, autonomy, and self-regulation. This has led to government policy that focuses on individual responsibility for personal circumstances, such as welfare programs tied to ability to work. It has also led to the idea that health and happiness, along with pretty much everything else, are things we achieve through our individual behaviors and actions. This was not always the case, but neoliberalism and our ideas of wellness are interconnected at this point, and that interconnection seems normal to us. Our unspoken assumption is that wellness is our own individual responsibility and that we have control over it. We can and should stay and become well through our lifestyle choices and behaviors. This attitude has been especially evident in the U.S. through the proliferation of corporate wellness programs. This started in the 80s, and by 2013, 80% of workers in places with more than 50 employees belong to a mandatory corporate wellness program. These programs are wide-ranging, but are concerned with things like weight, cholesterol, exercise, healthy eating, sleep, and other biometric health indicators and lifestyle choices and behaviors. Participants, or those who meet specific targets, often get discounted insurance rates or better insurance coverage. Through these programs, wellness becomes intertwined with definitions of health that are measurable, especially in terms of insurance costs, sick days, and worker productivity. These programs' stated goals are to ensure healthier, happier, and more productive workers, and to save the company money on health insurance premiums, especially on disability costs. In reality, they've not been shown to achieve any of these goals. These programs, though, along with an increase in neoliberal government policy, have contributed to the widespread adoption of this view of individual responsibility for wellness culturally. Although both corporate and government wellness programs and policies started with physical health, they've in recent years expanded to include mental health. We have had an increasing perception over the years that mental well-being and happiness is something we can achieve through our personal actions and behaviors. What's wrong with all this, you might ask? Isn't wellness a good thing? And aren't personal actions like exercise, healthy eating, and stress relief positive? Well, yes, they are. All of these things are good. In fact, because of my disability, I spend much more time and effort than many normal people do making sure I exercise, eat well, and get enough sleep because these things all impact my daily pain levels and quality of life in an immediate and significant way. So I'm all for healthy lifestyle choices. But there are problems with the way we define wellness and the way we think we need to achieve it. The neoliberal focus on the success or failure of individual action turns formerly partly social issues like health into the personal problems of individuals. 
it completely ignores the underlying social, cultural, economic, or other structural issues that contribute to poor health. In fact, a whole body of research on public health has established that structural issues contribute substantially to poorer individual health outcomes. If you live in Flint, Michigan, or Grassy Narrows, Ontario, and have had your water poisoned, your health is less likely to be good. If you work in a hazardous occupation or in a precarious job, it impacts your health. If you belong to a marginalized community, whether Indigenous, racialized, immigrant, LGBTQ, you are far less likely to have good health and are in fact more likely to have a disability of some kind. None of these things are your fault or your responsibility or are under your control. No amount of healthy eating or yoga or corporate mental wellness programming is going to erase this kind of structural health disadvantage. Neoliberal views obscure these structural issues to distract us from them, so we don't feel the need to protest them and change the system. Next I'll talk about what this means for disability. In this neoliberal view of wellness I've been describing, disability and wellness are often linked. For example, in my own university, the person in human resources responsible for accommodation for people with disabilities is called the Health and Abilities Consultant. But that connection is very problematic from a disability perspective. Our main cultural view of disability is what disability activists call the medical model. We generally view disability as an individual person's medical problem. In this view, disability is a medical deficiency and implies a lack of wellness by definition. This view of disability as lack of wellness has penalized people with disabilities in corporate wellness initiatives. BASIS shows that corporate wellness programs characterize disability as something to be eliminated, and consultants promise employers lower disability costs, which presumably only happens by eliminating workers with disabilities. Even if they can maintain their jobs, many workers with disabilities who are not able to participate, say, in corporate fitness programs, are penalized with higher health insurance rates, lesser or no insurance. Although it's illegal to discriminate against workers on the basis of health issues, corporate wellness programs are an exception to discrimination laws in the U.S. and therefore provide a loophole for discriminatory practices based on health status. Our cultural focus on individual responsibility for wellness boils down to what Susan Wendell calls the myth of control. The neoliberal view perpetuates a widespread myth that the body can be controlled in various ways, such as wellness. It's our responsibility to work to achieve the ideal body or health status through our own actions. If we don't have good health or an ideal body, though, the myth of control still holds. We must have failed because we didn't work hard enough or do the right things. It must somehow be our fault since it's under our control. This view leads to people being blamed for not being well. If you have a disability in our society, you are likely used to being treated with suspicion or receiving all sorts of unsolicited health advice on what actions you should take. People have told me, for example, that I should eat more bananas, exercise more, exercise less, do a different kind of exercise, take certain medications, or see a different doctor. This advice is well-meaning, but the underlying assumption is that I have failed to do something I should be doing. I must not be trying hard enough, or I've made the wrong choices. My lack of wellness is somehow my fault. Disability activists, of course, take a different view. They've advocated for decades to promote an alternate view of disability called the social model. This model takes the focus away from the individual disability as a medical or health issue. It says that individual health problems are not necessarily an issue because people can still have good quality of life. The main problem is social. There are many barriers in society that create problems, including the attitudinal, social, and structural barriers that people with disabilities face. Ableism is the term used for societal structures that assume everyone is able-bodied and well by default and disadvantage those who aren't. Disability activists have made many gains, reflected in hard-fought legislative improvements like the AODA in Ontario, which has concepts of ableism and the social model as its underlying assumptions. But our neoliberal focus on well-being as an individual action and lifestyle choice is directly opposed to this view of disability and is a real regression. Our current views of wellness reinforce long-existing stereotypes of people with disabilities as medically deficient, responsible for their own health issues, and therefore undeserving. What this all boils down to is that from a disability perspective, our cultural concept of wellness reinforces and participates in ableism. It also reinforces racism, colonial, and other inequities, since erasing structural inequities disadvantages all marginalized groups. I don't want us to lose sight of that, since disability is highly intersectional and all these issues overlap. 
So all of this was my long-winded way of providing context. What does it all mean when applied to wellness and libraries? For one, it means that wellness initiatives often have a neoliberal assumption of wellness as a personal action and responsibility, which as I hope I've pointed out is inherently at odds with disability and other forms of equity and inclusion. As a person with a disability, I haven't always been impressed with the approaches to wellness I've seen around me. For example, as I was writing the initial proposal for this session, I got an email from my institution about a campus session on how listening to music can improve my mental health. Then I came across this article where a library was concerned about growing mental health issues in the student population and decided in response to this to give out free cups of tea. De-stressing is important, don't get me wrong. I like music and I'm a big tea drinker, so free tea seems very civilized to me. But making claims that participating in these programs will somehow improve or address mental health is an insult to those with depression and mental health related disabilities. Those of us with disabilities face many barriers in using or working in libraries, and for most of us, these programs have nothing to do with wellness. What do I suggest as an alternative to library wellness programming? At a bare minimum, as usual, please make sure you aren't ableist. Don't be insulting or harmful to people with disabilities, and make sure your programming is accessible. Music and tea are great, but frame them as stress relief, not as a mental health strategy. At this point, I want to go back to the overall question raised by the conference theme. How and should we even engage with wellness in academic libraries? From a disability perspective, I would suggest that our best alternative is to not focus on wellness at all, at least in its currently understood neoliberal social form. This definition of wellness is a concept that's incompatible with the truly inclusive view of people with disabilities in society. But there are other views of wellness that we could focus on instead. Wellness can also be defined as a healthy and inclusive society, not as an individual-specific issue. I would love us to move past the individualistic neoliberal view of health and wellness and look at the structural inequalities and reasons for health issues instead. We did this, in part, for a while, quite well during the pandemic in Ontario. There was public discourse around the structural reasons for illness and a recognition that some people were more likely to become ill due to all sorts of factors, including, for example, socioeconomic status, immigrant status, being a racialized or indigenous person, gender, type of job, age, underlying health conditions, residence in a congregate setting or in a remote northern reservation with poor access to medical care. We made sure people with structural inequities around health were prioritized for vaccines, talked about the barriers they faced in accessing vaccines, and in general had widespread public discourse around acting as a society to help protect more vulnerable people. It was heartening. Then, people got tired of the whole pandemic and we turned a switch and forgot all that. We went back to our neoliberal view of wellness, with everyone responsible for their own health, which again became all about making individual choices about actions and behaviours. The structural inequities all got dropped. I'm asking you not to drop it though, but to focus on them. If you want to help students with mental health issues, then understand the structural barriers they face at the university and at the library, and work on addressing those. Marginalized groups have higher rates of mental health issues and all types of disabilities, so look at barriers faced by racialized, indigenous students, LGBTQ2S students. For me personally, as a person with a disability, a major source of stress is the ableist attitudes and structures I encounter in my workplace. Tea and music aren't going to fix that, but learning about disability, race, indigeneity, and being truly more inclusive in our policies and practices would make my life a lot better. One example of inclusive practice is the recent COVID return to work at my library. We were told all through the pandemic by administration how much they appreciated us and were concerned about our well-being. But when it came time for us to return to in-person work, suddenly there was a very inflexible idea about what work from home parameters were acceptable. When we tried to include health and wellness as reasons to work from home, we were told that was not acceptable. And if we had health issues, we needed to make formal requests to the university for disability related accommodation. This response completely misses the point. For many people, but especially for people with disabilities, flexibility in work policies and hours and work from home options are critical for wellness and key to a healthy workplace. Without flexible policies like this, my health would be worse and I would perhaps need to request an accommodation. With flexibility, my health is better and I likely wouldn't need an accommodation at all. If we really cared about wellness, we would be looking at implementing policies that proactively allow for people to maintain their wellness. A lot of this presentation has been pretty negative. 
I'm not opposed to health or wellness. In fact, those are things I think about and spend a lot of time on in my life. I'm just advocating for us to approach it thoughtfully. Be careful how we think about it and implement it. Consider who it includes and excludes, and what the implications are of what we are doing for marginalized groups. We need a fuller picture of wellness that includes the systemic inequities that impact so many of us. Here is my bibliography again. A copy is also included at the end of the transcript I've provided with my presentation.